Welcome to World Changers Church. We're excited that you're here. When you stepped through our doors, you didn't just walk into a building. You walked into a family. And no matter who you are, where you come from, or what you look like, you're welcome here. We believe that God is love and that His grace rekindles lost passions, repairs broken dreams, and fills empty lives. We believe that a life in Christ is not a formula of rules and laws, but a moment-by-moment relationship with Jesus. His love for you is infinite and everlasting, without pretense, conditions, or discrimination. We can't stand religion, but we love God. And if you're not sure what the difference is yet, we can't wait to show you. So, let's get started. Welcome to World Changers Church. People like you change the world. Renew your mind, your spirit. Renew your life at the 2020 Grace Life Conference. Check out this year's speakers you don't want to miss. Creflo Dollar. You got to have your own relationship with Jesus. Taffy Dollar. I receive the gift of grace. Michael T. Smith. Let me give you news. You are not in the flesh. Gregory Dittow. It's the equalizer of every human being. And Andrew Womack. Being sensitive to the Lord can change your life. Your life will never be the same again. It's changed your mind, heart open. It's just life-changing experience. Can't miss it. Don't miss out on this opportunity to set your life back on track at the 2020 Grace Life Conference, July 6th through the 10th. Register today by texting Grace Life to 51555 or visiting creflodollarministries.org.
worship your great name. Here we go. We love to call your name. It's something we cannot explain. That happens when we proclaim your great name. Your great name. Say, we love to Hallelujah. call your name. Yeah.
You never fail, you never fail, you never fail, you never fail. You never fail, you never, never fail. Oh, you never, you never fail. Cause your promise still stands. That great is your faithfulness, your faithfulness. And we're still in your hands And that's our confidence That you never fail us Oh, give them worship wherever you are Hallelujah Oh, oh. Give them worship wherever you are Stand on his promises. He'll never fail. Us. No, no, no. He'll never fail. Us. No, no. He'll never fail. Us. Praise God. Welcome, everyone, to our Tuesday night Bible study. Praise God. I, I'm excited. I'm stirred up because of the word of God, because of Jesus Christ. And as we begin to get into this word, let us let us open up with a word of prayer. If you would join me, Heavenly Father, we thank you. Uh, Lord, we thank you for this day. We thank you for your goodness that we've seen out of this day. Lord, we thank you for your promises that you are forever faithful to. Lord, we thank you that we are, we will not be the same uh, after we hear the word tonight. We thank you, Lord, that, that you are faithful to your promises and we give you the praise for it. We come with expectations tonight. We, th we come, Father God, ready to hear from you, ready to receive. Uh, we thank you for what is already done in heaven out of this night and we thank you for it now in jesus name and all those agreed said amen praise god welcome to world changers we're excited uh that you decided to join us and i, I believe that this this season that we're in as we've been discussing over the the past few weeks uh being in this time of rest and the, being the greatest position for us as believers to be in um we just have to learn to stay there. Amen. I believe as Christians who are, are may not be familiar with what I'm referencing when I'm talking about resting and staying in position, you have to allow the word of God to be the final authority in your life. What I mean by that is that it's not about what you feel. It's not about uh, what you used to, what you used to hear from your, your, your parents or your grandparents, you have to make a conscious decision to say, you know what, regardless of what I heard, regardless of how I feel, the word of God is the final authority. And what that means is that I realize that as a believer, I am already seated in Christ. I'm already in the position to win. I'm already in the, the victory position, meaning that I can't allow the devil to come and move me from my position. We've been talking about this, man, and 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 we're we're trying to encourage you to stay at rest. I know that the the temptation to go back to your normal lives, to go back to the things that you're familiar with, is there. You know, the news is showing it that people are crowding the beaches and they everybody's out now. But you have to know that. Wait a minute, I don't have to respond or 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 operate according to the world's way of doing things but I, we operate according to god's way of doing things meaning that i may there may be a temptation to follow the crowd but praise god i, I know that i'm already seated in victory so therefore i'm not going to be moved by what i see amen and i want to i want to encourage you that because that that's it's becoming a point where 
It's like everyone's now going back to their lives, whether they're whether the government is saying OK to do so or not. And we have to we can't allow that to to move us. We can't allow what others are doing to move us. I have to be still and position myself to hear from the Holy Spirit on what would he have me to do. Amen. And that's how you operate as a believer. So over the past few weeks, we've been talking about rest and understanding that rest only comes through Jesus Christ. Rest does not come through the law of Moses. It does not come from any self, uh, performance based religion, but it only can come through the person of Jesus Christ. So last week we talked about the days of rest and how Jesus Christ, who is the representation of the Sabbath, which is referenced in the old covenant where God said to honor this, honor the Sabbath. It's the seventh day. It's the day where God finished his work and check this out. He blessed the seventh day out of all the, all, out of all the work that he finished and completed. He blessed the seventh day, which was the day that he rested. He didn't now God didn't rest because he was tired. He rested because he was satisfied and he trusted in the work that he finished. And likewise, when we're in Christ, man, we trust in the finished work of Christ. We trust in the rest that comes through Jesus Christ. Amen. And not through our own performance. I know we keep we keep saying that because it, we have to get to a point to where we cannot trust our performance to try to bring us to God. And so tonight, we're going to continue to talk about resting in grace. Amen. Resting in grace. Because I want us to know what, yes, we know what rest is. We know that we come to Jesus Christ and we rest in the finished works. But tonight's going to be different because I want us, I want us to bring this rest to a, a practical place, meaning that how does rest help you in your everyday life? How can rest, and I'm sure you're probably thinking the same thing, well, how can rest help me pay my bills? How can rest help me to, to, to find success in life? Whether you, you had say it or not, I believe that everyone at some point wants to experience success in some arena in life. Otherwise, you you just living on the earth and, and want to be average or just to exist. But you want to experience success in some area. But the problem lies in how do we get there? Uh, sometimes we, we rely on the things that we do, our routine, uh, things that we, we, we've seen others do to try to emulate their success versus hearing from God and finding out what the true meaning of success is and what he views as success, because I guarantee that he's going to view success. He views success differently from the world's way of viewing success. So you don't want to look at others and try to emulate their actions to to find success because you may they may uh, view success differently from God's point of view. Amen. So we want to to bring this rest to a practical point. What I mean by that is what am I resting in? What am I resting in? I know that I have I rest in the finished works of Jesus Christ. I find rest there. But what am I resting in? What am I resting in? How does that how does that me resting help me function in life? And man, I'm telling you, it's going to be exciting because it's going to be something that's going to challenge you to where you're you're going to say, "Wait a minute. You know, this this I don't know about this." Uh and it may be because of things that you've heard in the past and others who may attack the true gospel of Jesus Christ. And they call it prosperity gospel, which is not not no such thing as prosperity gospel. It's only one gospel and it's the gospel of Jesus Christ. But you have to know what am I resting in? Amen. Let's turn over in your Bibles to Matthew chapter 11, verse 28. And we're going to we're going to get into uh, resting, man. We're going to get into resting in the finished works of Jesus Christ, but we want to know how, what is it, what am I resting in? What am I trusting in? You're telling me to trust in what Jesus has done. All I know is that Jesus finished the work of my salvation, but how does that? See, we want to keep breaking it down. This ministry is about 
uh, simplicity and understanding so you can apply it to your everyday life. How, I want to keep breaking the word down. Amen. Keep breaking it down. Every time you hear the word, you say, okay, I understand it from a spiritual point of view that I'm seated in Christ. I'm saved. My spirit man is new. How does that now break down into what I experienced in it personally? And I'm walking in it personally. So what, and then we break it down from there. So, amen, I'm excited. Let Matthew 11, 28, in the New King James Version. Praise God. says, come to me, all you who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. I will give you rest. Jesus promised to give us rest. It is a free gift. It's by grace. Amen. And when you come to Jesus Christ, you come to the gift of rest. What is resting from what? Resting from what? Resting from the law of Moses, resting from your religious activities, your religious works in order to try to prove yourself worthy to God. He said he's going to give you rest from that. Meaning that he's going to fill your heart. God's, Jesus is going to fill your heart with the assurance that you are already pleasing to God. What happens when that when Jesus fills your heart with that? That means that you're no longer working to try to get anything from God because Jesus fills that void. He fills that emptiness that religion can't uh, fulfill. And religion will have you working and religion will have you working and religion will have you giving and doing all sorts of things, never bringing you peace. And instead of and instead of resting, you're you're worried about it. Did I give enough? Did I do enough? Did I pray enough? Or when you're not receiving the answers to your prayers, uh, did I pray long enough? Did I get enough people together to pray? And those things can be worrisome. Those things can be uh, uh, stressful. Because you're never, you're never sure on the fact that I'm pleasing God. And so Jesus says, come to me, all you who labor, and I will give you rest. Let's look at verse 29 in the, it's in the New King James. I want to look at verse 29. It says, take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. Jesus said it again. It says, You'll find rest. You'll find rest for your souls when you come to Jesus Christ. When we're talking about coming to Jesus, we're talking about coming to grace. Jesus is grace personified. And when we when we look at grace personified, we have to look at everything that he is and everything that he finished for us on the cross. And as a Christian, as a believer, it took me years to get this. It took me years to understand that what Jesus did over 2000 years ago applied to my life today. And I'm sure like many of you, I just thought the Bible was was to show us, yeah, who God was, but what he was able to do. And I didn't really apply it to my life. I didn't really apply grace to my life. It took me uh, really continue to hear it. And that's what you got to do. You got to keep hearing the word. You got to keep hearing it. And you got to you got to begin to say it. You got to be you got to believe it. You got to say it. You have to speak it so that it gets in your heart and you begin to see the words uh, off the pages really become alive in your heart because you spend so much time declaring what you believe. I can't tell you how important that is that you spend your days believing the word. You spend your days believing what God said. And once you begin to believe that, amen, you begin to walk in that. So Jesus is telling us he's really comparing the law. When we look at Matthew 11, 28 to 29, he's comparing the law. Talking about his, his joke is easy. And, and when we come to him, uh, we'll find rest. Versus the law, you, you can't find rest. There's no rest there. Let's look at John chapter 6. Verse 30, when we're talking about comparing the law and grace, that that's, you know, that begins to get become very touchy subject because you still have a lot of people that say, hey, don't talk about my Ten Commandments. <laughs> Why are you telling people that they don't have to fill the, fulfill the Ten Commandments? 
you're telling them that it's okay to sin. No, we're not. We're telling you that Jesus is telling us that he's fulfilled it. So because Jesus fulfilled it, why are you trying to live according to the law of Moses? And besides, it's not just 10. You have to keep the whole, uh, the, all 613 of the laws. You have to keep every single law. So it's not just a 10. So don't, don't allow yourself to, once again, live based on what you've heard in the past or live based on what you saw from your relatives. You have to allow the living word of God, amen, to shape your way of thinking, to live on the level by which God is trying to take us to. Amen. Praise God. Let's look at John chapter 6, verse 30. We're going to go to verse thir uh, 35 in the New King James. It says, Therefore they said to him, What sign will you perform then that we may see it and believe you? What work will we will you do? They're asking Jesus this. He said, Our father, they said, Our fathers ate the manna in the desert. As it is written, he gave them bread from heaven to eat. And I want to just pause right there and keep that up. It says they, they're now they're talking about what their father's experience. And so now they're trying to get Jesus to perform. <laughs> Amen. They're trying to get Jesus to perform like uh, God, the father performed in the days of Moses. And they're trying to get they're trying to put performance on Jesus. So I, I love Jesus's response. And and what type of performance now requires? Let's look at uh, verse 32. Praise God it says, then Jesus said to them, most assuredly, I say to you, Moses did not give you the bread from heaven. Moses didn't. He said Moses didn't give you the bread from heaven, but my father gives you the true bread from heaven. Verse 33. For the bread of God is he who comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. So Jesus is comparing the law of Moses. Jesus is comparing the work of Moses versus what he's come to do. Verse 34. Then they said to him, Lord, give us this bread always. So now they, they're wanting the bread. They want the true bread from heaven. Jesus opened their eyes to realize that, no, that wasn't the real thing. But I am the real thing. Glory to God. Verse 35. And Jesus said to them, I am the bread of life. He who comes to me shall never hunger. And he who believes in me shall never thirst. Praise God. Jesus is giving us a powerful example of what happens when you when you come to him. Amen. When you come to the true bread from heaven. It says you'll never hunger. You'll never thirst. What is he referencing? Now, is he talking about physical hunger? No, he's talking about you'll never hunger or no thirst for God when you come to the true bread of life, which is him. He'll, feel, he'll fulfill all of that hunger and that thirst uh, that you have for God. And, man, this is, so, this is so vital because they were blind. They were blind to what Moses had, had done. And then they were trying to put Jesus in that same performance. And you have to be careful about people who are who are in performance based Christianities because they're going to try to get you to perform on what you say you believe. Praise God. And you have to realize, wait a minute, I don't have to perform to anybody. That's what the serpent wanted to do to Adam and Eve perform. He tried to what was he trying to do? He was trying to move them from their position of authority. You don't have to perform for, for the enemy. You don't have to perform for people to show them what you believe. All you have to do is say, this is what I believe. You can choose to believe it or not, but I'm not going to perform to get you to believe. You're just going to have to make up your mind that I believe the word of God. Amen. So Jesus is showing us here the, his authority over the law and him being the true bread of life. Amen. Let's look at Matthew chapter 5, verse 17. Praise God. Man, I, I pray that you all are you all are getting this rest. And now I'm not talking about just physical rest. We we talked about that. Uh, not just talking about, oh, rest means that you don't do anything and you just sit there. No, it's while I'm working, which now becomes the work of faith because I'm in rest. It means that I'm now being led by faith to do the works. I'm trusting in what Jesus has already done. 
Amen. I'm trusting that I already have the wisdom through Jesus Christ. I'm trusting that I'm already holy. Amen. And so now it's not about inactivity, but it's about the activity that's led by faith. But I'm trusting in the finished work of Jesus Christ. I'm trusting that it's already present. Somebody say it's already present. Amen. Your, your healing is already present. Praise God. Your, your deliverance is already present. Your success is already present. Praise God. It's already present. So we're, we're going we're gonna to get into this thing, man. We're going to talk about, you're going to see what am I supposed, what am I resting in? And how does it apply to my everyday life? So I'm, I'm kind of trying to give you a little bit of where we, the journey we've been on, where rest is concerned for those of you that are just joining us. But I'm also trying to make sure I get into tonight's message and understanding what am I resting in? And how does rest, this rest, how do I pl apply it to today? Pastor, how do I get rest? How does rest <laughs> pay my bills? You're telling me that I rest and I receive that. And I receive it through Jesus Christ. But how does it now, uh, how do I take that to my everyday life? And the fear that may be present, the, you know, the, the job security fear may be present. How does that, how does all that apply now to every day? And so we're, we're grateful to be able to show that to you tonight. Matthew 5, 17. It says, do not think that I came to destroy the law or the prophets. I did not come to destroy, but to fulfill. Jesus came to fulfill the law. He didn't come to destroy it. He didn't come to, he didn't come to take it away. And so for those of you that think that we're telling people that the law is no longer of importance, no, we're not saying that at all. We're saying that Jesus, he didn't come to destroy the law. Grace didn't come to destroy the law. Grace came to fulfill the law. And because we believe in him and the faith that's in him causes us to fulfill the law because we are now in Christ Jesus. And the Bible says that the one word fulfills the whole law. And that's that's love. That's love. Love fulfills the law. Love does not hurt your neighbor. Love does not wrong a man. It's the love of God that was poured in our hearts when we received Jesus Christ as Savior, which causes us to fulfill the law. Amen. So there's your argument. <laughs> there's your argument for those that think that we're trying to tell people that the law is no longer uh, is no good or it's no. The law is holy. The law came from a holy God. The problem was we're not holy and we could not keep the law. We were not perfect. Only Jesus is perfect, and he was the only one that could keep it. So because we're in him, God says, you have fulfilled the law. Amen. Praise God. So as we begin to get into this thing, I want to talk about what am I resting in? I know what I'm resting from, and that's the dead works of religion. But what am I resting in? And I pray that as you as you begin to discover what you're resting in, you'll find confidence while you're there, uh, confidence in what Jesus has done. You'll find confidence in your ability to move forward in life. You know, sometimes fear causes us to stay stuck and sometimes ignorance when we don't know things causes us to stay stuck and we're we're afraid to move. And because you're afraid to move, you're not walking out God's best in your life. And sometimes people can stay stuck for years. I mean, years, 10, 20, 30 years because of fear. And that's the problem with fear. It keeps us stuck in position. Well, I want us to, I want us to, as we, as we come to understand what am I resting in, I want you to release your most holy faith, which is the faith of Christ to grab hold of what Jesus has done. And when you begin to find out what am I resting in, Man, I pray, I pray it's going to stir you up and you're going to leave out here with such confidence, with such hope that Jesus is my champion, man. Jesus is my savior. Jesus has done it all. Jesus finished it all. And he's only asking me to, hey, just believe, just believe in what I've done and you'll have it all and you'll never go in lack. 
and you'll never hunger nor thirst again if you will just believe. Praise God. I, I just want you to just believe. Somebody say, just believe. Just believe in Jesus. Don't let anyone move you from your position of believing. Man, just believe. Believe God. Believe his word. And know that he is not man, that he should lie. He doesn't lie in his word. If he says you're holy, praise God, you are holy. Pray. I can only imagine the the how Paul was trying to argue. It says he, he argued and he reasoned with them uh, in the book of Romans daily. He said he did that for two years. He taught on a daily basis, reasoning the gospel of Jesus Christ, trying to convince them. That's how long it took. And I don't even know if he even accomplished what he was set to do there, but it took him two years. He said he did that for two years. He reasoned daily. Amen. And, and, and just to sh get them to believe the gospel. That's how hard it can be sometimes to step away from yourself, to step into what Jesus has done. It's something you got to hear every single day. All the time you have to train, you have to train your mind to trust God. You have to, your body, when your body wants to say, oh, I feel sick. Let me do something to try to get healed. You have to remind your body, wait a minute, body, we are already healed. Amen. You have to just remind your body. I'm all, I'm, no, I know what the symptoms say, say, but we're not moved by the symptoms. You know, the symptoms can can do a couple of things. It can notify you what's going on. Uh, and also it's trying to move you to do something about it, but you have to remind those symptoms. Wait a minute. I'm already healed. I know what the symptoms say, but I'm not going to receive anything other than my healing that I already possess. You have to, I mean, you have to realize that there's Jesus on the inside of you. And because Jesus is on the inside of you, sickness cannot dwell in the same body as Jesus Christ. I mean, it has to be that real. It has to be. You have to believe that. You have to believe that Jesus is in me first. Amen. We're not talking about you believing in healing. No, I'm talking about you believing is Jesus in me. If Jesus is in me, my body cannot, my, my body cannot in, uh, inhabit uh, sickness. Sickness can't inhabit my body because there's Jesus, there's Jesus who is the healer already on the inside of me. Amen. And that's how, that's how I grab hold of my, you know, anything that tries to attack my body. I just remind the symptoms, Hey, Nope, this is not COVID-19 can't be. Why? Because Jesus is in me and because Jesus is in me, I'm all, I already possess him and he is my healing. Amen. Jesus is the source of your healing and divine health. I want you to say that after me. Jesus is the source of my healing and divine health. He is the source of it, meaning that healing begins and ends with him. <laughs> Amen. It's not something that we can do or something that's separate from Jesus. Jesus is the source of healing and divine health. If you're going to tap into the healing you have to realize that, wait a minute, I have healing in me first. Amen. Praise God. So what are we resting in? I'm just going to go over about three tonight. But it's so much more in terms of what we're resting in. But these are the three that the Spirit of God put in my heart to, to deal with tonight. And I pray, man, this is going to be good. This is, this is going to be good. This is going to change your life forever. Uh, one is... Our standing with God. You know, when the enemy shows up and he begins to talk and he begins to accuse you, that's what he is. He's an accuser of the brethren. One of his main areas of attack is your standing with God. And he wants to accuse you of not being in right standing with God. And Oftentimes, he's able to be successful with people who don't know they're standing with God. And how is he successful? Basically, he's successful by telling them that you have to perform in order to increase your standing with God. I can't tell you how many times, you know, there were times when, when I didn't really get this. And 
and I was not seeing answers to my prayers, but then I was hearing others receive answers to their prayers and, and it didn't take them long to get it. And the first thing I thought was that, what are they doing that I'm not doing? I'm sure we've all been there. You know, you, you, you prayed the prayer, you prayed according to grace, right? You, you say, I believe I received what's already done. You, you prayed according to what you been taught how to pray and there's nothing wrong with prayer there's nothing wrong with declaring there's nothing wrong with confessing what you already have but then when that that factor of time comes in you know some some miracles some manifestations may take uh longer than others but it's in that time of where i'm waiting for the manifestation of that peace that i said i have of that joy i said i i, I, I take hold of but while i'm waiting you're not waiting alone I need you to understand that while you're waiting, you're not going to be waiting alone because the enemy is going to be right there in your ear trying to convince you that you have to do something to get what you said to come to pass. You're going to have to increase your standing with God if you want to see quicker manifestations. Ladies and gentlemen, do not fall for that tactic. That is a that is a tactic of the enemy to move you out of position out of he's trying to move you away from receiving mode and into work mode so you have to realize that i'm resting i'm resting in this my standing with god what is my standing with god according to the finished work of jesus christ what did he finish where my where my standing with god is concerned like, well let's look over at second corinthians chapter five Verse 21, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 21. What did Jesus finish concerning my standing with God that I'm supposed to be resting in? This is going to be the most vital point. I'm, I'm starting with this as number one because this is going to be vital. If you don't believe you're right with God, then you, you'll never have any earnest expectations of manifestation in your life. You will always wonder in the back of your mind, Am I right with God? And you allow you you're giving the enemy ammunition to destroy you when you do that, because you don't realize you don't know where you stand with God. Second Corinthians five twenty one. It says, for he made him who knew no sin to be sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of God in him. <clears throat> we have become the righteousness of God in him, in Christ Jesus, meaning that I have become right with God. I have become, I, I am in right standing with God. He made him who knew no sin to be sin that we might become the righteousness of God. If I don't get that I am right with God, I am saying that the very sin that he put on Jesus' body, it did not happen. Because for him to take on sin, he didn't just take sin from anywhere. He took on my sin nature. He took on my sin nature. So if I don't believe, if I don't believe that I'm right with God and I'm righteous because I'm in Christ, then I'm also saying that I don't believe the sin nature that he took from me and put on his physical body. And that man, that's that, that brings it home <laughs> because I'm, I'm saying that the work that God did through his son, Jesus Christ is not valid. Amen. And, and we we can't we can't allow the enemy to put us in that position when he's trying to convince us that we're not right with God because what he's really saying is that Jesus did not take your sin away. What the enemy is really trying to imply is that you still have the sin nature and God is not pleased with you because you're not doing right. You're not doing right, and and you're trying to you're not you're not doing enough. You're not praying enough. Man, you're not giving enough. You know, that's what religion does. It'll, it'll try to influence works in order, for, to, in order to increase your standing with God. That's why we have such a problem with religion. Because there, it has a form of godliness, but it denies the power 
which is Jesus Christ. It, it denies the power of the Son of God, which finished the work. And it's just religion just wants you working because it, it, it profits off of your labor. <laughs> oh, my God. It profits. Religion profits off of your labor, off of your your desire to be right with God. Religion is profiting. Man, I know this is. Man, this is tough to hear. But religion wants you to be in your emotions. So they can keep you working and keep you forever chasing God. And that's the problem. It, it, religion just keeps you chasing God. And keeps you chasing him and chasing him. You're trying to get him. You're trying to do all you can to get to him. You're trying to live a holy life. You're, and there's nothing wrong with living holy. You're trying, to, you're trying to be perfect. And you're trying to show others that you're perfect. And you're trying to cover up your tracks. And the sins that you commit, you're trying to hide them. Until one day it all falls down because the house you built was built on your performance and not on Jesus Christ, and your house collapsed, and you're the only one there left to try to pick up that house. Religion is nowhere to be found. And, and as a matter of fact, religion just kicks you while you're down. Say, like, you must have sinned. That's why your house failed. That's the problem with religion, is that it, that it, it just places burdens on your shoulders that they don't even carry. But it just appears that way because they're condemning you for your for you missing the mark and for you making a mistake. And when you're when your life crumbles, they say, well, you must have sinned because you it wouldn't have failed. Your house wouldn't have failed. Your life wouldn't have failed if you did not sin. But meanwhile, behind the curtains. They're sinning like never before. And the life they're trying to portray you to live, they don't live. They can't live it, but they're profiting off of you because now you're trying to give your way into the kingdom of God. You're trying to give your way into God's right standing. You're giving yourself, you're giving your finances, all of your resources, and they're profiting off of your ignorance. You don't know that you're righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. You don't know that he took your sin nature away so that you could be holy and so that you could be right with God. You don't know. So just by the fact of you not knowing religion is profiting from you. Ladies and gentlemen, you're right with God. <clears throat> you're in right standing with God because of Jesus Christ. You're righteous. You need to say that. I'm the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. I'm in right standing with God. Say that after me. I'm in right standing with God. When the enemy shows up and tries to convince you that you're not right with God because you made a mistake, you just need to remind him, I'm right with God. I don't have to perform for him. Jesus performed enough for everybody. I just need to believe that I'm right with God based on his work. That's hard. It's easy to say, but it's hard for those of you that have been stuck in religion where you were condemned for your bad behavior. You couldn't figure out why am I in this cycle of sin? And internally, there's this war going on. I'm trying not to sin. And instead of living life in this liberty in Christ Jesus, you spend your days trying not to sin. You wake up trying not to sin. And that's your focus, trying not to sin so I can get God to bless me. Trying not to sin so I can stay right with God. Instead of I'm living in the liberty that's in Christ Jesus. I'm living in the, the, the right standings. Now that the position that I've been placed in because of my faith in Jesus Christ, I win. Amen. Praise God. Say that after me. I win in Christ. Glory to God. You win what? You win every battle, every war, everything the enemy tries to come against you with. You win because of your standing in Christ Jesus. You're standing in righteousness. I know for those of you that have heard this before. You need to keep hearing it. 
Why? Because you might be righteous today. You might feel you might have received your righteousness today. But how many of you know next week when the pressure's on, something happens in your household, something something's presented to you, you're gonna you may not see righteousness. You may see labor. You may see let me try to do something to fix this. So it's something you have to keep hearing till you become more confident in your standing with God. Let's look at uh, Romans chapter 3, verse 21. Romans chapter 3, verse 21. We're going to go to verse 22. Somebody say, I'm the righteousness of God. Praise God. It says, but now the righteousness of God, apart from the law, is revealed, being witnessed by the law, and the prophets. So the righteousness of God has been revealed. Verse 22, even the righteousness of God through faith in Christ Jesus or in faith in Jesus Christ to all and on all who believe for there is no difference. He says to all and on all who will who believe. Praise God. That's it. Righteousness of God to everyone who believes, not to everyone who performs well, but to everyone who believes. Somebody say, I believe. You believe you have to believe this. There's nothing that's going to you're going to see from Jesus unless you first believe. Believe in what? No, you have to believe, believe in Jesus Christ and his finished work. And the the very most and the most important work that he finished was your standing with God, and you are standing in righteousness. Let's look, let's look over in Romans chapter five, verse seventeen. I, I can just recall the days in this journey of how I would question my standing with God because I didn't see any manifestation, and that's usually where it happens. Where, where it happens at. It's when you you declare something, you believe what you say, and you just don't see any manifestation. Time goes by, you don't see any manifestation. And immediately, you begin to question this standing with God. Or, you just make up some excuses to why you didn't get it. I went through this. It was, well, you know, let me let me look back, what did I do? Did I, you know, did I confess? Did I confess that I, I've already received it? Uh, did I curse my harvest by, you know, not giving uh, the full amount that I said I was going to give or, or promise that I made to God that I didn't fulfill? You know, you see how this works? And you just keep thinking about what did I not do? Because I need this to manifest. I need this to show up. You know, sometimes you think you need the resources, but God has already provided the favor. And because we keep our mindset on, no, I need the resource. I need the resource. I need the money. We fail to see the provision of favor that he's already provided for us. You can't allow yourself to be focused on uh, what you want to see happen, what you're expecting for it to, to manifest. You have to, you have to trust that whatever has to happen in order for this thing to manifest, in order for the favor to show up, God has already committed to doing it. So I'm not going to focus on the fact that I, I may need the resources, but he may give me favor. He may, tell, he may be speaking to me and tell me to call. And that there's favor that's already there. I don't know, you know, some of you may looking at starting a business and 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 you're thinking you need the money to do it. But God is saying call anyway. Why? Because you're focusing on the, the money part. And I'm telling you that there's already favor there at the door. And because we, we set our minds on this, this is what I need. This is what I need. This is what I got to have to move forward. We don't even see all the hundred thousand other ways that God can bring about this promise to pass or whatever you declared out of your mouth to come to pass. 
God has a million ways to bring it to manifestation. Don't stay stuck in one way. Be open to God and his direction. Be open to him and his direction and allow him to lead you to manifestation. Amen. Where are we at? 517, Romans 517. Praise God. It says, for, by one, for if by one man's offense death reign through the one, much more those who receive abundance of grace and of the gift of righteousness will reign in life through the one Jesus Christ. Amen. It says, those that have received this gift of righteousness. Somebody said, I received the gift of righteousness. Receiving the gift of righteousness. He says, you will reign in life through Jesus Christ. Do you know what that means? That means that because you receive this standing with God as a free gift, nothing that I've earned because you receive this standing with God. As a free gift, he says, you will reign in life through Jesus Christ. That word reign means to rule. Man, you're going to rule over your troubles. You're going to rule over debt. You're going to rule over lack. You're going to rule over sickness. You're going to rule over poverty. You're going to rule over things that are not of God. You're going to rule over them because you received this gift of righteousness through Jesus Christ. Amen. You got to receive it as a gift. You have to receive as a gift. Amen. You have to receive it. It has a gift. It can't be earned. You can't mean that you can't even expect payment based on your good deeds. You have to receive it as a gift. And that takes something that you do it. You remind yourself daily that I receive this as a free gift, meaning that even when I'm doing well, and this is where the hard part comes in, even when I'm doing well, when I say doing well, meaning that, man, I'm stirred up for Jesus, I'm waking up every day, I'm confessing the word, I'm declaring the word, and you know, I spend time praying in my heavenly language, and I spend time uh, thanking God for what's already done. I'm doing all the right things, right? I'm not, you know, not in trouble. I'm not doing anything out, you know, crazy. I'm doing everything that seemed to be right. And even that I can't go and expect payment from God for what I've done. Because then I have to look at why am I doing all of it anyway? Do you see, you have to, if you ever find yourself expecting a payment because you've been confessing, and you woke up every day, you've been joining us for confessions, and you've been saying the confessions, Dr. Dollar and Pastor Taffy leading us through confessions uh, on a daily basis, and you you woke up every day, and you, man, I, I wake up every day, I've been saying the confessions, I've been declaring the word over my life. If you begin to move to a place of where I'm expecting payment or compensation because of what I've done, then I'm and I'm doing then you have to look at that. Are you doing that to earn something from God? Everything takes a up. You have to observe everything that you're doing and you have to reflect on why you're doing what you do. Am I doing this to earn something from God? There's nothing wrong. Great. It's awesome confessing the word because for us, it just reminds us of what we have. And. The enemy can't convince me of anything else because I've spent time remembering what I, I already possess. I already possess healing. I already possess success. I already possess these things. So the enemy can't convince me otherwise. So that's why we confess. That's why we, we get involved in confession. We begin to, our lives now begin to line up with what the word says and what we believe. Uh, we believe we have the authority. We call those things that be not as though they were. That means that I use my authority. To, to declare over my life what it should be. And it lines up with the word. So you have to look at, am I expecting a payment? Am I expecting this to better my standing with God because I do this? Because then if you are expecting payment, then you're trying to earn something from God. Amen. <coughs> Excuse me. So that's number one. 
our standing with God. That's, that's one area. That's the main area that we are resting in. That's our standing with God. And we have been made righteous through the one man, Jesus Christ. That means that we're in right standing with God. Number two, our basic necessities in life. What does that mean? It means that I'm resting in the finished work of Jesus Christ. And a part of that finished work is our, as children, our basic necessities in life are already provided for. That means that I'm not going to allow the enemy to come in and provoke fear on me and say that I'm not going to eat today. Or I'm not, we're not going to have enough groceries for this week. Or we're not going to have our lights on. No, these are basic necessities that the Father is committed, <laughs> praise God, to meeting the needs of our basic necessities in life. And you're going to understand how this, what, how does meeting the basic necessities and living in the, in the abundance, how does that go together? And why is it different? But I know what I without a doubt that I'm resting in what Jesus has done. And that's God's commitment to take care of my basic necessities or basic needs in life. Praise God. That means that you don't have to fear of not having your basic needs met and God not taking care of you as his child. That's so powerful. Let's turn over in your Bibles to Matthew chapter six, verse 24. I don't have to fear that my basic necessities in life are not going to be met. As a child of God, I'm not talking, for those of you that are not born again, this doesn't apply to you. But it can apply to you. If you just receive Jesus Christ as Savior, it will apply to you. God's not a respecter of persons. But what do you believe? But I know, as children of the Most High God, glory to God, I don't have to fear about our basic necessities in life not being there. God is always going to make sure you're taken care of, and you need to believe that. Let's look at uh, verse 24, Matthew 6, 24. We're going to go down to verse 31. Amen. I pray you stir it up. Glory to God. You are, man, you are taken care of. God is committed to your victory. Amen. It says, no one can serve two masters. This is going to be important. It says, no one can serve two masters, for he will hate the one and love the other, or else he will be loyal to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and mammon. I want to pause right, just pause, I want to keep that up. I want, well, I want to pause right there because it, it's making a clear indication here. Jesus is saying, you cannot serve God and mammon. Mammon is the evil spirit that can work through money. And he says, you can't serve God and money. He says, you can't serve. You will hate one or love the other. So you have to, you're going to have to make a choice. Okay, let's keep going. We'll, we'll get into mammon at, uh, later at a later time, but we, we can't serve God and mammon. You have to choose one. Verse 25. It says, therefore, I say to you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat or what you will drink, nor about your body, what you will put on is not life more than food and the body more than clothing. 26. Look at the birds of the air, for they neither sow nor reap nor gather into barns. Yet your heavenly father, your heavenly father feeds them. Are you not of more value than they? Verse 27. Which of you by worrying can add one cubic to his stature? In verse 28, so why do you worry about clothing? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. They neither toil nor spin. Verse 29, and yet I say to you that even Solomon in all of his glory was not arrayed like one of these. Verse 30, now if God so clothes the grass of the field, which today is and tomorrow is thrown into the oven, will he not much more clothe you, O you of little faith? 31, therefore do not worry saying, what shall we eat or what shall we drink or what shall we wear? 
Praise God. He says, you don't have these things you don't have to worry on. You don't have to focus on. All you have to do is see the love of God, the love of your father. He even referenced and called him your heavenly father. As children of God, I know and I'm resting in the fact that God's going to take care of my basic necessities in life. You don't need a miracle to eat dinner. Why? Because God committed to meeting the basic necessities of life. You have to get that because people are in fear now. They're trying, they're fearing for their livelihood. Their businesses are not able to open uh, or they, they want to open, but no one wants to work because they're fearful of COVID-19. And, and so there, there's a lot of fear ramping in the land and, and there's unemployment as a sky high. And so there's a lot of things that are taking place now, but you have to know without a doubt, my heavenly father, if you can't call him father, when, you can only do that by being a child. And you become a child when you believe in Jesus Christ. But my heavenly father, glory to God, I know I rest in that he has he has and will make sure that my basic necessities in life are met. It's amazing that he says he referenced mammon before he gets into this. Because what happens is when you don't believe that God's going to take care of your basic necessities. You begin to trust money to do that. And that's what mammon does. It wants you to trust it, money, more than you trust God. So he references mammon before he gets into this so that you don't trust the money to meet your needs. So that you don't trust the dollar bill to meet your needs. It's a tool, but I'm not putting my trust in it. You understand? I trust God. I trust my heavenly father and I'm resting in that my basic necessities in life will be met. I will not trust money. I will not trust the spirit of mammon behind money. That will not be my pursuit, but my pursuit is Jesus Christ. He is the, he is the mark. And as I pursue him and his way of living, I'm believing first and foremost that I'm already equipped with the ability to live like him on the earth i have to believe that first but i will not trust money to meet my needs somebody said well how, how are you supposed to you know you just turn money away no i'm not saying turn it away i'm saying i'm not trusting it you have to understand when i trust god money's pursuing me <laughs> glory to god when i trust him wealth is pursuing me versus me trying to pursue it I'm trusting God and wealth is just coming into our hands. Wisdom to get it is coming into us. All these things to lay hold of it is just is pursuing us because my pursuit is of God. I trust him. Praise God. You this is this is one of the most vital points. Outside of your standing with God, you you have to know that your basic necessities is on God's mind. Jesus said, don't worry about that. Don't worry about tomorrow. He says, look at the birds of the air. They neither toil nor, they neither sow nor reap. What is he saying? He, they're not working, but God is still feeding them. Glory to God. You're at rest and you're not trying, you don't have to go work to get God to meet your basic needs. What I mean by that, I'm not saying physical labor. I'm saying that I don't have to try to do good in order to get God to bless me with some basic needs. I have to believe that he already has taken care of that. And so while I'm laboring or while I'm at work, while I'm doing what I do on my job or career, what have you, I'm not, I'm not worried on whether or not I'm going to eat. I'm not worried on whether or not my basic needs or necessities are going to be met. Why? Because God is already committed to that. Meaning that if your, your company closes down, God already had an opportunity open for you. He's going to make sure whatever needs to happen for your basic needs to be met. Uh, he's already committed to that. Amen. Praise God. Let's look at Philippians 419. I'm resting in that. I'm resting in the my basic necessities already been met. I'm resting in Jesus Christ. And because I'm resting, 
Praise God, my basic necessities in life are met. Philippians 4, 19. It says, and my God shall supply all your need according to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus. God is committed to meeting your needs in Christ Jesus. Let's go to uh, Luke 22, 35. Praise God. I want to get at least get through these three and uh, we'll be we'll be finishing up. I'm already at number two, which is. Uh, our basic necessities in life. I'm resting in Jesus, and and in that rest, my basic necessities in life are taken care of. Luke 22:35. Now here's Jesus at the him sending out the disciples to go minister, to share the good news. Uh, he tells them to leave everything, which is interesting because everything that they would need to buy food, he told them to leave their food. Take nothing for your journey. And here's Jesus talking with them after it all. And he says, and he said to them, when I sent you without money back, knapsack and sandals, did you lack anything? So they said, nothing. When you, when you resting in Jesus Christ, whatever you need for your journey, glory to God, whenever you need to carry out God's assignment on your life. He's going to supply that. Amen. If there's a basic necessity, the basic need to fulfill your assignment, Jesus, through his finished work, has already made provision available. Amen. Let's look at not Luke chapter 9. Luke chapter 9, verse 12. Luke chapter 9. Verse 12, we're going to read 12 and 13. Praise God. Glory to God. It says, when the day began to wear away, the 12 came and said to him, send the multitude away that they may go into the surrounding towns and country and lodge and get provisions. For we are in a deserted place here. But he said to them, you give them something to eat. And they said, we have no more than five loaves and two fish unless we go and buy food for all these people. What's interesting here is Jesus had compassion for the hunger. Jesus had compassion for the hunger of these people. And instead of following the orders of the disciples, Instead of following the orders of the disciples to send the people away so that they can go get their own food, Jesus has the compassion to say, no, you feed them. I need you to, to understand that Jesus is compassion. He has compassion towards you and your, your needs, the things that we need on a day-to-day -day basis. And because of that compassion, because of that love, he's committed to those that will rest in him to making sure that your day-to-day -day needs, needs are taken care of. And that's encouraging because I need you to trust in what he has done instead of you trying to labor to go get and take care of yourself. I have to believe first and foremost what Jesus has done so that I can rest in that provision. Amen. Praise God. Praise God. Just lift your hand. I want you to say, thank, Lord, I thank you for supplying our basic needs day after day after day. As we find rest in Jesus Christ, and we thank you for it. We trust you. We trust you, Lord. We trust the work of Jesus Christ and our supply. That's already at hand. We give you the praise for it in Jesus name. Amen. One more I'm going to share with you and we're going to finish up for tonight. Number three. Number three, the third thing that we're resting in. And this is going to this is going to change you. Uh, the blessing. The blessing. We are resting in 
the blessing. Now, the blessing, the purpose of the blessing is to bring about the abundance in our lives in order to extend it to others. The blessing that we're resting in is the purpose of the blessing is to bring about the abundance in our lives so that we can extend it, the excess into the lives of other people. Let's, I, I, I want to kind of, I want to give us, I'll give a scripture and then we're going to, we're going to look at this more uh, later. Galatians chapter, chapter three, verse 13, Galatians chapter three, verse 13. Let's go ahead and get into this. We're resting in the blessing and the blessing is not like the basic necessities. The blessing is the overflow. The blessing is the excess. And I know people will debate this and say that God, God don't want us to have more than just enough for ourselves. That's actually a very selfish way to think that God would just want us to just have enough for our household. Why? Because we are funnels for God to flow his free favors and his and his supply and the blessing into the lives of other people. That's the purpose of the blessing is to bring about the abundance in our lives. Praise God. Galatians chapter three, verse 13. Praise God. Galatians chapter three, verse 13. We're going to go over the scripture and then we're going to wrap up for the night and we're going to pick back up next week or Sunday. It says Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law, having become a curse for us, for it is written curses, everyone who hangs on a tree. Verse 14. That the blessing of Abraham might come upon the Gentiles in Christ Jesus, that we might receive the promise of the spirit through faith. So through Christ Jesus, we have received the blessing of Abraham and we're going to look at the blessing. We're going to look at what that means. Uh, we're going to pick back up there next on Sunday and talking about the blessing and how the blessing is the purpose of it is to bring about the overflow to extend it into the life of others. I'm resting in the blessing so I don't have to try to work for the blessing. Amen. Praise God. Let us lift our hands. Father God, we thank you for this time. Lord, we thank you for the rest that has been given to us through and by Christ Jesus. And we give you the praise for it in Jesus' name. Lord, we thank you as we prepare to sow our seed tonight. Lord, we thank that you're directing us, you're guiding us to sow. Lord, we trust you. We trust what's already done. We know our basic necessities are met and the blessing uh, is in us. And, and it, it's the overflow of your goodness. And we give you the praise for it now in Jesus' name we pray. And all those agree, said, amen. Praise God. If you want to sow today, you want to give, the information is on the screen. We encourage you to get involved uh, with what Jesus has done. We, we encourage you to get involved with the word, this ministry and what we're doing and preaching the gospel and pushing the gospel forward. We believe that the gospel is what causes lives to be changed. One after the other, one life after the next. And we are changing the world through one person at a time. Amen. So we want to encourage you to, to sow. And as you're preparing your seed, amen, we thank God that uh, things are just never going to be the same again for you. Not because you're giving, but because you trust that he's already meeting your basic needs and necessities in life. Amen. Praise God. Let us stretch our hands forth. Father God, we thank you for the seed to sow. We, we, we honor you with this seed. And we thank you, Father, that it is well with us and our households. In Jesus' name, we pray. And all those that agree said, amen. Praise God. Well, if you're here today and you have made Jesus Christ the Lord of your life and you want to receive Christ Jesus, all you have to do is believe in what Jesus did on the cross. And through your belief, amen, you become a child of God. We want to hear from you. We have prayer counselors that are ready to minister to you and give you biblical understanding of what you're receiving tonight. Uh, if you would, look at the information that's on the screen. Contact the ministry. We have prayer counselors that want to minister to you. 
praise God. And we're going to go ahead and stand in agreement with those that have been changed and been impacted by this message. Father God, we thank you. We thank you, Lord, for the seed that was sown, the word that has been declared over the lives of your precious people. And we give you the praise for it. In Jesus' name we pray. And all those agree said, amen. Praise God. Praise God. Well, God bless you. We are so grateful that you joined us here tonight. And we look forward to virtually fellowshipping with you on Sunday. God bless you. See you tomorrow, Grace Minute, 3 p.m. Don't forget. Take care. God bless. Today's Grace Minute.